Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all the books that I read in the first half of March. It is that time again and I have been doing a ton of reading for a lot of different things. I know I said in my February wrap-up that I wanted to try to make this more of a mood reading month. I have not been. <laughs> not been terribly successful at that for a variety of reasons, but it's okay. So today is going to be a little bit of an interesting mid-month wrap-up because while I have read a pretty large number of books, about half of them I've read for other projects and probably won't go into a ton of detail in this video. I'm going to give you a little bit of a recap of how many things I've read and for what reasons I've read them before we get into all of the books. If you're new to my mid-month wrap-ups, the way that I do this is I talk about all the books that I read in chronological order at the end of the month when I do my final wrap-up. I go over my stats and talk about everything from lowest rated to highest rated, but for this video I'm just going to be talking about them in the order that I read them. I will however start with my first DNF because I did have one of those this, this month, but to give you a little bit of a heads up on how much reading I've been doing, I don't know, I'm like I... part of it is because I'm doing it for projects and for vlogs which I think pushes me to get through more faster, and also I've been reading a lot of romance and if you watched my recent vlog where I read romance books you might see that I can sometimes read as much as like two romances in a day, so that's part of it. So far in March I've read 23 things, that's really a lot. <laughs> It's a lot. One of those was for a manuscript critique, which is not something I'm giving a star rating to, and I'm not going to be talking about it on the channel, but I am including it in terms of page count for reading. Three of the books that I read are for judging the Vivians, which is a romance award. I can't talk about any of those books until they release the winner in July, so I am vlogging that, and eventually this summer you will get to hear all my thoughts on all the books I'm reading for that. Then I read three books for a secret TBR video that I'm doing. Um, I am currently in the middle of the last two books for that project, so as you're watching this I think it might be in the next video that you get sometime in the next few days you'll be getting a secret TBR video, so look forward to that. And then five of the books that I read were for my romance reading vlog, which was mostly covering neck alley arcs plus one additional one. If you haven't seen that video I will link it up above. For the books that I read for that video I will talk about them more briefly here, but if you want to hear detailed thoughts check out the vlog. Okay, with all of those caveats, which is way more than I usually have for a mid-month wrap-up, let's go ahead and talk about my one DNF and then we'll talk about the books that I read that I can tell you about. Okay, so for my one DNF I want to say up front this is not a bad book. In fact, I think it's a very good book. I think it is effectively doing what it sets out to do. However, for personal reasons, I chose not to finish it and I DNF'd it around the 50% mark. So I'm going to tell you about the book, what it is, what it's doing, and then give you kind of a content or a trigger warning for why you might want to be cautious with it, which is the reason that I chose not to continue with it. This is a book I had for review from NetGalley. It is The Cost of Knowing by Brittany Morris. It's basically a hard-hitting YA contemporary that has a slight speculative element to it. The main character is a black teen boy whose parents, when he was like 12 or so, had died in a tragic accident, and ever since then he's had this gift or maybe curse where anytime he touches something he sees a vision of that thing in the future. And this might seem cool, but it has actually ended up being not so great for him and is compounding the anxiety and trauma that he's already dealing with. So when he touches something and sees his younger brother dying, he decides to try to reconnect with his brother for the first time in a few years since the accident and take advantage of the time that they have left together. So that's a lot of the story. There's also kind of a side plot with things going on in the neighborhood that are dealing with microaggressions and different accepted forms of racism. So look, this is a very well executed book. It is a love letter to black boys who've had to grow up too fast. It is tackling a lot of really tough topics and I think doing it very effectively. I knew going in that it was going to be intense and I knew that it was going to tackle some difficult issues. What I was not prepared for, however, is the thing that ultimately made me decide to stop reading it. So the main character, as I said, deals with very severe anxiety. We are in first person perspective, we're in his head the whole time, and uh, he, he deals with anxiety pretty much constantly. 
And Brittany Morris does a fantastic job of viscerally depicting the experience of it having that level of anxiety, but it's nearly nonstop. And as somebody who myself deals with anxiety, I was finding it to be too much for me to read. I can read about characters who deal with anxiety. I tend to like it, but usually you get breaks from it where like you'll have a couple of scenes that are more intense, but most of the story is not that, that I'm fine with. This was not that, this was you are in his head the whole time and he is constantly dealing with severe anxiety. So is it well done? Yes, it really is. However, I would just say use caution if that's something that could be triggering for you, be aware that that's in there. Um, not a bad book, but I chose to DNF at the 50% mark because I was just really struggling with reading it. And I wasn't even reading it that quickly. I was reading it like a chapter at a time. So for the sake of my own mental health, I decided this is just not going to be the book for me, but um, I wouldn't dissuade you from reading it if that sounds like something that you can deal with. Uh, so that was my one DNF this month. Moving on to the books that I finished reading. First up was an audio review copy from Neck Alley. This is called Digital Nomads in Search of Meaningful Work in the New Economy by Rachel A. Woldoff and Robert C. Litchfield. This was really interesting. It like the, the, the topic sounded interesting, which is why I requested it. It was an audiobook and I think the audio is done fairly well. It is more of an academic text. It's an ethnography of an expat community living in Bali. These are expats from all around the world, not just the United States, but other places as well. Primarily millennials, primarily people with some level of privilege from middle class to upper class backgrounds who have moved to Bali because of the low cost of living where they can reconnect with nature, be entrepreneurial or work long distance as freelancers. So the authors are a married couple who went and spent time in that community to do this kind of ethnographic research. And, um, you know, I had kind of mixed feelings about it. In, in some ways it was very interesting. It was definitely an intriguing phenomenon, an intriguing group to hear about. And they do a good job of unpacking like what are the values of this community and what do they do and how do they do it and how do they end up there. It was interesting and I do think that the authors tried to recognize and address some of the problematic things that get wrapped up in this. For instance, the fact that most of these people do come from relatively privileged backgrounds. The fact that the entire community really smacks of neocolonialism in terms of the expectations that they have on local culture serving their own whims, in terms of the fact that the reason they're able to live with less income is because of the economic state of Bali. And yeah, so like, so yeah, it's definitely complicated and the authors do mention those things, but I'm not sure they really adequately grapple with the full ramifications of it or meaning of it. And instead, I think focus more of their time on what this group means for the modern workplace in developed countries and how businesses are not doing a great job of providing accommodations to their employees that make them want to be where they are, which is like a valid argument <laughs> to make. Um, but it's like from, it's directed at like a certain perspective and I don't know. So I had, I had kind of mixed feelings about it. It was interesting, but I, I wanted more from that analysis. I ended up giving this book three and a half stars. Next, I finished a book that I started last month in February. This is a buddy read with my friend Liana from Liana's Library. We read The Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden. This is the sequel to The Bear and the Nightingale. And I am so pleased to finally be continuing on in the series I've meant to for so many years. And um, yeah, I just think Catherine Arden's writing is beautiful. I love it. It's so lyrical and poetic. And I just think the way that she writes characters and plots and puts in high stakes and isn't afraid to put her main character in perilous circumstances is just so well executed. The, the pacing of this is perfect. I love the fact that even though it's the middle book in a series, in a trilogy, it has its own complete plot arc. Like you could get to the end of this book and if you didn't want to continue on to the next book, you you could stop. I do want to read the third book in the series and continue on with our main character's story. However, the main 
plot arc of this is completed in a very satisfying way. I also just think that the project of this series is so interesting because it's set in a semi-mythological version of Russia on the cusp of change from folk mythology into Catholicism as Catholicism is beginning to take over and it's really dealing with those tensions and addresses a lot of things to do with misogyny and gender roles in ways that I just find really interesting and really thoughtful. I really loved this a lot. One thing though that I do think you should be aware of is that our main character Vasya in this book spends much of the story dressing as a boy and posing as a boy and there is a scene in this book that involves the public outing of her gender assigned at birth. She does identify as female in this book but it's still really intense and I imagine could potentially be triggering for people who have a trans or non-binary identity so I just want to make you aware that that is a thing that is in this book. Other content warnings to be aware of, this does include a scene of traumatic birth, loss of a child, and lots and lots of misogyny. There are other things as well but those are some big ones that I just wanted to call attention to. That said, I really love this book and I did give it five stars. Next, because I needed a break from some other things I was reading, Reading, I read a couple of novellas by Ruby Dixon in the Ristiverse series. Ruby Dixon, if you're not familiar with her, is best known for the Ice Planet Barbarian series. She writes these very over-the-top, campy, sexy alien romances for the most part. Like, that's kind of what she's known for. And, you know, it's funny, I've discovered I really like her books. They really work for me, even though some of the stuff is like, a little out there and a little over the top. It's kind of done in a tongue-in-cheek way and the thing that really struck me as I was reading these two novellas that we're going to talk about is that Ruby Dixon is kind of a master of her craft in terms of having really strong character development in not a lot of pages. She creates these fleshed out characters that you can empathize with and find interesting in a, a very brief amount of time and not a lot of authors can do that honestly it's pretty impressive and there were there were reasons that this was striking to me but i was i was really noticing that and even though yes her books are more on the steamy side there is genuine emotion and feeling and relationship development and bigger themes that are getting explored in a light-hearted way and i've just been really enjoying that quite a lot the first novella that i read was the aliens mail order bride this is a prequel novella to the risdiverse series and i honestly loved this one. It was so cute and definitely had a trope combo that I enjoy. This one features a grumpy bachelor alien who lives on an isolated farm and wants a mail order bride to help him out with the work around the farm. So he writes away for this bride, she arrives, and instead of the alien woman he was expecting, he instead gets a human who's trying to escape her life on another planet. And he's kind of like, uh, this is not what I signed up for. You are very small and not strong enough to help me with the work around the farm. Like, we're gonna have to find another husband for you. And, you know, she's like, I understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he's like, well, you know, we'll just wait till this community gathering and then you can go and we'll see about finding a husband. Of course, in the days between picking her up and this gathering, they begin to fall for each other. And it's really cute. It's this very sweet slow burn romance between this human woman and this alien. And I loved it. It was really adorable. I did give this one five stars. In, in case you're wondering the way that this world that she set up, because the Rizdiverse is in the same same universe as the Ice Planet Barbarian series. And basically there are some bad aliens who will kidnap human women to be like sexual slaves basically and they see humans as like less intelligent and less developed and so all of these stories are about these women who are initially kidnapped but then are in some way freed or saved and end up falling in love and finding their person so just like a, a little bit of a synopsis of how that works. The other novella that I read from her I didn't love as much and I had some more issues with. This one is Pretty Human and it's another prequel novella for the series. I will say after reading it I read a little author note at the back and it made a lot more sense to me why 
it was structured the way that it was. This is one where I really had some issues with the power dynamics, but it turns out it was supposed to be a sci-fi take on Pretty Woman. And of course, Pretty Woman just sort of has power dynamic issues baked into the premise. <laughs> so it's a little hard to escape that. This one, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you the premise, it sounds really horrific, and it is, but the tone that she writes things in doesn't make it hit in a hard emotional way, if that makes any sense. Like she writes things in this light kind of campy tone where she's dealing with heavier issues, but not in a way that feels heavy. So in this story, our main character is a human woman who had been enslaved and is going to be given as a gift to a not so great alien male. And our hero is a noble blue alien at this house party, finds out that the hostess is going to gift this human to this other person, and he's like, no, I want her for myself. Give her to me. And so she's like, oh, okay. So he ends up taking her instead, and like, I mean, like, it ends up being kind of a romance. And he's like, I'm not gonna like do anything physical or touch you until you ask me to. And then, you know, so like, she kind of tries to do the best she can with the power dynamics. But honestly, it, it still made me a little uncomfortable. I didn't love it. I gave this one three stars. But again, as a retelling of Pretty Woman, this is kind of what you get. Next, I did a reread, which was really fun. I reread one of my favorite books of last year, and that is Caressed by Ice by Nalini Singh. This is book three in the Psy Changeling series, which I really love. It's kind of a paranormal romance series that I've been reading through. This is my personal favorite in the series, and the reason I read it is because my friend Mara at Books Like Whoa has started a new podcast called Changeling Cast, where each episode she's going through one of the books in the series and has invited me to join her on the Caressed by Ice episode which I'm really excited for. So it was just a pleasure to reread this. Judd Lawrence is everything <laughs> and I just, I loved it. It was just as good the second time around. I think the series is so very, very good and I'm looking forward to discussing it with her. Still five stars. Last year I gave it six stars, but rereads for me are not eligible for a six star favorite of the year status. Um, but yeah, I still love this a whole lot. Then I read a middle grade nonfiction book that was sent to me for review from Macmillan Kids. This is Baseball's Leading Lady, F.A. Manley and the Rise and Fall of the Negro Leagues by Andrea Williams. I am not a big sports person. I don't care a whole lot about baseball, but I really liked this book and I found it really interesting. I think if you like baseball, you'll probably like this even more than I did, but even if you're not a baseball fan, this is definitely worth your time. Effa Manley is the only woman to ever be inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. In the early 1900s, she and her husband owned a black baseball team and she was the manager of that team. She was also an activist, she was very outspoken, and I think she sounds like an amazing woman and um, reading about her and her life was really cool. One thing though to note is I went into this expecting it to be more of a biography of Effa Manley, and it's really not. They do use her biography and use her story as a thread to tie together the rest of the narrative, but the subtext part of this title is more accurate. It's about the rise and fall of the Negro Leagues in baseball. So this is tracing the history of black baseball, its rise and its fall, and it's really, really fascinating. This gets into a lot of information about the history of racism and structural racism, microaggressions that people dealt with, and more specifically how that applies applied to baseball. It also complicates our ideas about the integration of the major leagues as being a net positive thing for the black community, and I found that to be really interesting. The author talks quite a bit in here about Jackie Robinson and other black players who initially were brought into the major leagues and how it was more a thing about money, how it did damage to black owned teams and black baseball and basically that, that, that it's more complicated than the, the stories we tend to hear about it. So I found this to be really interesting, really thoughtful and would definitely recommend it. I will say the material is a little bit heavy and so I would recommend this probably for more the middle to upper range of middle grade readers. Maybe some middle grade readers could read it earlier but I would say this is probably for most kids gonna be like a 10 to 12 year old 
thing. But honestly, teenagers and adults could read it too and you'll get a lot out of it. So I ended up giving this book four stars and I would recommend it. The next five books that I read were all romances for that romance reading vlog that I mentioned earlier. So I'm probably not going to say a whole lot about each of them unless I'm feeling particularly inspired, but I do want to let you know what those books are. Four of them were review copies from NetGalley. First up, I had One Thing Leads to a Lover by Susanna Craig. This is an adult historical romance with a kind of mystery thriller element to it. I really loved it. I think this series is underappreciated. I love Susanna Craig's writing and I, I just thought this was fantastic. The heroine is a widow with two young sons and she ends up getting mixed up for reasons with the hero who is a member of the British intelligence. And I won't say more than that, but I really loved this one. I gave it five stars and it comes out in April. Then I read An Earl, The Girl, and a Toddler by Vanessa Riley. This was another one that I really enjoyed. It's the second book in a series that follows a group of widows trying to help other women. And Vanessa Riley is one of the only black authors writing Regency romance that I know of. So she's doing some really interesting work in terms of centering black characters during that time period and exploring a lot of the complexity that go with talking about race during the Regency era. I just think she does it really, really well. She does have kind of an unusual writing style that takes me a little while to get into, and her books are a little bit more slow paced than you might expect going in. But ultimately, I really enjoy them and end up rooting for the characters and being very invested in the plot. One other thing to note here is if you are a reader who prefers romance without a lot of steam, Vanessa Riley is a great option. She does closed door sex scenes and only has like kissing on the page, but she still does a really good job of writing that passion and chemistry between the characters. I gave this book four stars. Hi guys, editing Bethany here. I realized that I missed a book. I also for that reading vlog read The Intimacy Experiment by Rosie Dannon, which I really liked a lot. I think her writing is really improved from her first book, The Roommate, and I just also really enjoyed this trope combination. It's got a prickly heroine and a cinnamon roll hero, which I am always a big fan of. Also, I think in my TBR video, I misspoke. I said it was a porn star turned sex educator and a politician. It's not a politician. It's a rabbi, which is even more interesting. Um, also, this is own voices for Jewish representation, which is kind of cool. So yeah, I gave this one five stars, really enjoyed it. Talk about it more in my vlog. Then I read To Love and to Loathe by Martha Waters. This is a historical romantic comedy also featuring a widow and a sort of fake courtship thing with a hero who's a rake. I had very high hopes for this and I did not end up liking it very much. There were a lot of things that I get into more in the vlog that I found irritating, but the big thing that I want to point out here as a content warning is this, is the thing that really bothered me a lot and significantly brought down my rating of the book. So the story contains a side character who turns out to be queer and the main character proceeds to out them to all of her friends and be like, but don't tell anybody as if that's okay and as if using that as a jumping off point to talk about queer characters in history is okay. Like, I had some real issues with that. I think the author was trying to have a queer character and show how queer people lived in history and found ways to exist, but I really didn't think the characterization was done very well, and I had some major issues with the fact that it's glossed over that the main character shares that information with all these people, as if that's fine. Like, who are you to make the choice that, especially in a time period where it was incredibly dangerous for people to be part of the LGBT community? Anyway, that really rubbed me the wrong way. There were other things I found irritating as well. This one I ended up giving two and a half stars. And the final book that I read for that vlog was Actor Age Eve Brown by Talia Hibbert, which I adored because I just, I, I love Talia. She is an autobi author for me and I love her books. I love her writing. It always, <laughs> it always really works for me. I don't know, this one and Danny Brown are like neck and neck. I think Danny of the, the, the Brown Sisters series might still be my favorite, but this one definitely comes in close. I loved it. Eve is kind of a hot mess and the hero is this nerdy buttoned up 
sort of guy who owns a bed and breakfast. He is also autistic and one of the things that I really like about this book is it gets into what autism in adults looks like and also what it can look like in women and how it's often not diagnosed because it can present differently. This is, by the way, own voices for the autism representation, which I appreciate. And we have wonderful fat rep. I just think Tally Hibbert does such a great job of writing diversity into her books and she does really great fat representation. This is no different. It is body positive without being fetishizing and I just loved it. This one is also quite steamy, <laughs> like definitely quite steamy, but also funny. It made me laugh out loud. I loved it. I clearly gave it five stars. And if you want to hear more in-depth thoughts on any of those five romance titles, check out that reading vlog. The next book that I read was the Patreon book club pick for the month. That is A Big Ship at the Edge of the Universe by Alex White. So this is an interesting book. It's kind of a sci-fi fantasy blend. It is set in space, but there is also magic. It's definitely very plot driven and very action heavy following a kind of oddball crew as they're traveling in a spaceship trying to find a mythological spaceship. And there's lots of action, lots of fighting, figuring things out. I'm not going to get into a lot of details about the plot, but this has been compared to Firefly. I'm not sure I love the comparison because I feel like the characters on Firefly are so very very good and the characters in this book are interesting but I really wanted more from their development. This is not a character driven narrative at all and I kind of wish it had had a little bit more of that. You do get some queer representation. There are lesbian and bisexual women in this book and I think maybe a gay character too. One other thing to know is that Alex White is a queer and non-binary author which is kind of cool if you're looking to diversify your sci-fi reading. I think in general this is a book that is either going to be your thing or not be your thing. I think it's really going to depend on the kind of reader you are. If you love plot driven action heavy books you'll probably really enjoy this. Especially if you don't need a lot of explanation of world building stuff because one thing I did see in another review that I think is a fair criticism of this is that anytime there's something that could be technological instead of explaining it they just use magic in the sort of like hand wavy it's magic and it fixes everything like oh we need to hack into a computer magical psychic connection with things <laughs> like it's it's like that sort of thing so if that but if that doesn't bother you and if you like something that's really action driven I think you will probably really enjoy this it for sure has a fun tone to it Personally, I tend to prefer science fiction that is either more character driven or more driven by like political intrigue or mystery. And this book is neither of those things. It has some intrigue and some mystery in it, but it doesn't spend a lot of time on it. And similarly, the characters are there and they're good, but I didn't get as much from them as I really wanted. So I appreciate what this book is doing. For me, for how long it is, it was a lot of action. <laughs> I had a decent time with this book. There were parts of it I found really interesting and parts of it that were really fun, but it was definitely heavier on the action than I would prefer, especially given how long it is. And I ended up giving this book three stars. Then I read a review copy from NetGalley. <sighs> this one, <laughs> guys, this one was really disappointing because honestly I wanted to love it and I think it was put together with the best of intentions but I have some issues with it. So we're going to talk about it. This is Everybody Shines, edited by Cassandra Newbold. It is an anthology of short stories by YA authors about fat characters. And I was really excited for this, which is why I requested it. It comes out in May. I loved the idea of writing an anthology that is body positive, centers fat characters, and is full of joy, which is definitely the way the description of the book and the cover of the book sound. I also love the idea of an intersectional approach to this kind of an anthology. The authors that are writing stories in this are very diverse in terms of race, gender identity, sexuality, and I love that. I think it's very cool. Also most of the authors in this collection are themselves fat or plus size, which is also really great. Um, here, <laughs> here is my issue with this collection. I'm not sure how this was curated. I don't know 
whether there was much direction given to the authors. My guess is they just kind of brought these people on board and were like, hey, write a story about a fat teenager. And um, the way that this book is being positioned, I went into it expecting mostly stories that were going to be joyful and body positive about fat teens falling in love or doing cool stuff with this like vibrant feel, okay? Unfortunately, that was not what I ended up getting. While taken individually, most of the stories in this collection are pretty good. They're well written, they're well executed. Collectively, the vast majority of them contain a lot of very intense fat phobia. Um, and it's not seen as positive, but there is a lot of it on the page. <laughs> like it's it, it's a lot from strangers from friends from family internalized fat phobia it, it's really really intense and honestly as a fat person myself I kind of struggled to get through the entire anthology I kept thinking okay maybe like the first few stories are like this and then the rest of them will be less that way but that wasn't really what happened there are a handful of stories in this collection. There's 16 stories and I didn't I didn't do the math on it, but I want to say there were probably something like maybe maybe four-ish stories in the collection that were more what I was hoping for and they were great. They were fantastic. But the the vast majority of the stories in this collection were really emotionally intense and really dark and I was hoping for something that was going to be fun and joyful and instead what I got in terms of a reading experience was something that felt like being in a lot of like oppressive darkness moving towards the light at the end of the tunnel and so maybe while the endings would be somewhat positive to the stories I just yeah I worry <laughs> like if the audience for this book is fat teenagers I worry that this is going to do more harm than good in practice and I wish that this had been curated differently I wish that there had been a more of a focus on pushing people not to include trauma in so many of the narratives. Yeah, so this so that was definitely disappointing. I think from the, from the individual author's perspective, I believe these stories were written in good faith and I'm guessing that probably a lot of them poured their own pain and trauma and experiences into the stories that they wrote. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is like not the 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 vibe that the positioning and marketing of this collection is giving off. Um, so I wanted to make people aware of that and for those reasons I decided to give this collection two and a half stars. So that was a bummer. Next I listened to an audiobook from my library and this was on the recommendation of Ashley over at Bookish Realm. I heard her talking about this book and thought that sounds really interesting. Let me see if I can get the audiobook from my library and I am so glad that I read it. It is Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex by Angela Chen. This is a really accessible nonfiction title about asexuality, but honestly, I think everybody should read this regardless of whether you identify on the asexual spectrum or not. I think it's just really useful in reframing the ways that we think and talk about things like sexual attraction, desire, consent. It's very interesting. It's very thought provoking. And I think this does a really good job of showing the breadth of asexual experience, that it goes well beyond the more stereotyped sort of sex repulsed in individual to people with a variety of experiences. Some people who are open to sometimes having sex with a partner, some people who just very rarely experience sexual attraction, etc. So yeah, I thought this was very interesting. It was very thought provoking and I think it is well worth reading. The other thing I really appreciated about this is it takes a more intersectional approach to talking about it. It gets into the ways that gender and race can complicate things. For instance, there can be a stereotype of black men and black women being highly sexual. And so if you have a black person who is ace or a man who is ace who feels like he needs to be super sexual because that's like the male identity, how messy that can get and how complicated that can get and how people may not feel free to really be themselves or be honest with themselves about what they do and don't want. So yeah, 
I really liked this a lot. I gave it five stars and I think other people should read it as well. The final book I can tell you about that I read in the first half of the month is Guards Guards by Terry Pratchett. I'm so pleased that I finally kind of dipped my toes into Discworld. Um, this was my first book by Terry Pratchett and I read this partly in preparation for talking with Alan from the Library of Alexandria for a podcast episode. He is a big fan of Terry Pratchett and Discworld and is actually the person who kind of influenced me to finally give it a try. And so we're going to be talking for a podcast episode about it and I wanted to have at least read one of his books. And I think it was really interesting. I had a good time with it. I like the humor. It's very similar in tone to like Monty Python, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So if you find that kind of humor funny, you will probably also find this funny because it's very, very similar. I did find that I got a little exhausted with it, reading it for long chunks of time. This might be the kind of book that I would do better with reading like in smaller bits instead of trying to read it so quickly because I, I would like, I laughed out loud quite a lot in the early part of the book and then I kind of was like, okay, like, <laughs> Like, let's keep going. Um, but in general, I do think it's very funny. It's very clever. And th the plot is kind of predictable. It's it basically these sort of bumbling guards trying to save their city from a magical dragon that's attacking everything. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting thematic things that he's doing here. I think it's going to be a good conversation. I look forward to talking to Alan more about this. And I can for sure see the appeal, but I also see why this would be a polarizing book. Like this is definitely not going to work for everybody. But if you haven't tried it, it's worth a try. One other thing that I didn't love is there are no chapters. It's just like one continuous narrative. And I didn't really like that. I, I don't know that I had given a lot of thought to how much I like having chapters in books until this, but I really like having chapters in books, especially with a book this long. So yeah, you kind of have to like find your own places to stop. I didn't love that so much. Overall, a fairly good experience, and I did give this one four stars. So there you have it. Those are the books that I read in the first half of March, at least of the ones that I can tell you about now. It's been a productive reading month. There have definitely been some highs. There have also been some lows, and it's a little weird that I can't talk about the full array of like what those things are. But moving into the rest of March, I have some really exciting projects coming that I'm looking forward to, and you know, I've been having fun. So talk to me in the comments comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for question of the day, tell me about what you find funny. Because this is the thing, I think humor is very subjective and people have wildly different senses of humor and wildly different senses of like what they find funny. For instance, I think there's quite a lot of stuff in Guards Guards that I think is really funny, but not everybody has the same sense of humor. So talk to me about a book or a movie or whatever that you think is really funny and what it is that you find entertaining about it. I think that would be an interesting conversation to have in the comments down below. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more, and if you want to support the work of the channel, check out the Patreon linked down below or check out channel memberships. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.